Welcome back, everyone. It's theCUBE's live coverage here in Las Vegas. I'm John Furrier, your host of theCUBE. My co-host, Dave Vellante, head of CUBE Research. Yuli Navalis here, strategic advisor <laughs> at SAS. Podcast extraordinaire here on theCUBE. Po podcast with SAS as well as other endeavors. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. See ya. So I love this topic conversation we're going we're gonna to riff on. AI's influence on the human experience, pondering AI. That's the topic, you do a lot of podcasting on this, talking to leaders. Um, Let's first talk about the podcast. Give a quick coordinates. Where do you find it? How many episodes you in on it? How far you in on it? Yeah, the, the podcast is the best job I never wanted. <laughs> um, I think I expressed my uh, skepticism about it when it first started, but it's the best job. You guys know this, right? <laughs> you get to talk to yeah. a lot of people about a lot of things and ask them a lot of questions, and it's, it's fabulous. So we're at about 48, 49 episodes yeah. now. Nice. Um, we were doing this somewhat episodically, or seasonally, I should say. Um, for the first uh, two years here, and we're just about to transition now in weekly? to bi-weekly. <laughs> okay. Um, and we're about All to right. dip our toe into, into video, so this will be a good uh, test run, maybe. It's just audio <laughs> with a little video. It's like multimodal podcast. <laughs> yes, we'll, you know, we'll see. will so. bring into their AI machine and Give us all yeah. the insights. Yes. <laughs> we'll have machines doing it we'll for do us. Our, we'll do our best. <laughs> okay, so, so what are you working on now? Give us a taste of the, the topics you're covering and what you're doing. Yeah, so we really do, as you said, talk to a very broad swath of folks and, and topics. Mm -hmm. And I know you here today are talking yeah. to a lot of folks about the technology, so uh, some of the more recent conversations that I found very interesting or some of the themes are, number one, what really is the impact in the near to medium term of AI and AI augmentation on human work, um, on skills uh, progression, on opportunity. Um, I continue to be really interested about how the language we're using to talk about AI, how we use to describe it, how we use to define it, impacts our perceptions and then our ability to apply that properly. Uh, so that's also a theme that's gotten threaded through a lot of our episodes, yeah. whether we're talking yeah. to you know, the sociologists or um, folks that are dealing with uh, industry applications. And of course, the Gen AI has been a perfect storm, so there's yeah. a, a lot of learnings there. The excitement, the enthusiasm. Yeah. It's high confidence, getting there, right? I mean, well, people, I mean, there. you have people who are like pro AI, I'm pro AI, like, mm -hmm. I'm, I love AI, I can't, I can't get enough of it. Um, some are like, whoa, whoa, slow down, stop, slow it down. And then you got the international piece, Dave, we've been seeing like people debating, slow it down, rein it in, or let chaos reign and then rein in the chaos, as Andy Grove would once yeah. say. So what's, what's your view on that? Because it's different, how do you see that playing out? Or is it more pro AI or what's the sentiment? What are you seeing for the sentiment? Because there's two schools, you don't want to stop the innovation. At the same time, you don't want it to go out of control. Yeah, and, and I know you folks are going to be talking to Miriam Vogel and Reggie Townsend yeah. about this the, the push-pull or maybe the tension that's yeah. happening right now as we see a, a vast evolution and explosion on the regulatory front and that question of is regulation, yeah. does it stifle innovation? My, my perspective is it doesn't, regulation doesn't stifle innovation, regulation stifles harms. Um, so I think if we're mindful, I, to some extent asking like, you know, do we need to sort of stop AI, put it yeah. back in the, the bag? We can't do that, it's, yeah. it's unrealistic. It's but I also I think talking about AI just as do we talk, stop AI writ large is in some ways nonsensical because AI is a portfolio, right? Yeah. Like anything else, it's a portfolio of, of uh, tools. Um, each yeah. of those tools have their own capabilities, their own limitations. Yeah. So for me, it's really more about are we being mindful about when and where we are applying the right tool to the right application and putting the guardrails around you, it. You mentioned language, using, using language. Mm -hmm. is it, do you have an example of where you feel like the language that we use for AI is not correct or it's misplaced or maybe not aligned with reality? Yeah, I, I think so. I, as you said, I do think that when we are loose with the language we use to describe or just in our excitement to hype up uh, these applications, we set expectations mm -hmm. that we cannot meet. We, we are either <laughs> Uh, setting unrealistic expectations about the system's capabilities and or about their limitations. And this has a lot of potential detrimental effects, mm -hmm. both broadly and publicly in society, but also for how an, an organization adopts AI. So one of my least favorite phrases right now is someone will say, you know, open AI, chat GPT, or an LLM of its ilk, has access to all of the knowledge ever created 
right? All human knowledge that's ever been created, we have access to that. And, and you know, that is categorically false. So we know, yeah, we know that's, that's not true. We know that's not true. But the, the problem with that is the, the corollary, the unspoken corollary that happens for a lot of folks is like, therefore it must know more than I do, and therefore it must also be right. So when we're putting in things in like a you know a standalone LLM or ChatGPT and something comes out, it lowers our yeah. inhibitions and it causes us to maybe question our own instincts, our, our own knowledge, and that mm -hmm. that is that's problematic. Um, it's it's particularly problematic um, when we are expecting these things to give us advice in very you know discrete applications and places where, whether yeah. it's you know a healthcare diagnosis or it's a it, um, social services or whatever that might be it so it does a good mm -hmm. job of writing it yeah, the, yeah, the yeah. false information it, it sounds like it's an uh, ivy league uh, education uh, exactly <laughs> do you think that ai has to have access to all the world's information to be for a, for something like agi to happen, or will will AGI just be smart enough to figure it out like Einstein with the theory of relativity? So I, I will leave some of this to the, the folks that are more technically adept than I am, but I don't think so. I, I'm not sure that this is the path by which we get to AGI. I think we also have to have a broader conversation about what does AGI really mean and look yeah, like. Sure. I mean, what is it that Fair we enough. actually right. want that to accomplish for us and, and not to accomplish? But one of the things I think that's interesting, and back to the, the you know, note we just made about uh, language, when we look at something like a large language model and we have this expectation that it's going to you know, spit out an, an answer that is perfect, it also sets this expectation that there's very little work required, even yeah. today, to be able to implement that system in a productive way, yeah. right? And Today, again, all these aspects, language, like does, that's one piece of the puzzle, right? And so we need to be much more yeah. cognizant of the fact that it's not just going to be taking the current technologies, giving it access yeah. to you know, all, of the, all of the knowledge that we had, even if that were possible, right? Because yeah. this is not a technique, even if, even if it had access to all of the knowledge that was ever created and had perfect knowledge of it, these are text synthesizers. They're not knowledge management systems. So if you want to, you're in a situation where truth is paramount and facts are paramount, yep. you are going to have to build other guardrails and use other components in concert you know, with that. So uh, I think that's my, why the model, the models that SAS is selling was mm -hmm. impressive to me because it's the first time I saw someone say, hey, we're going to have models, yeah. lightweight models that you could use for situations to either yeah. cross-connect other data sets to get truth, because mm -hmm. LLMs, the top ones, aren't going to know everything. This hallucination, Dave calls it Swiss cheese. Uh, and then now the vector embeds are doing so well, that linguistically, the language that we speak or we write, the ability yeah. to convert that into math changes the whole retrieval game. That's why the, we're sure. seeing the RAG uh, retrieval augmentation generation booming, because hey, with, you can use AI with your data and then do that, like for us, our, our vector embeds, we do a lot of speech, mm -hmm. text. Yeah. So we use a lot of jargon, serverless, Amazon, AWS, SaaS, sure. you know, lingo, jargon. And the AI picks it up beautifully and matches conversations mm -hmm. that you'd never type in a search engine. Sure. What did Kimberly say? What Kimberly said on theCUBE and what Brian Harris said, I want to search on that. Like, no, it can't make that leap yeah. with keywords. Math goes, wow, we talked about the same thing as Brian Harris, so these two videos are near each other. I find that as illuminating because that's the beginning of what we're starting to see with, with how AI is going to work. Yeah. It's going to make things better. So the question is work, right? Back to, you, back, back to your yeah. thesis about changing the work environment. So, okay, work's going to get better and smarter, faster. Um, that should elevate the game of the human. We, that's what we're saying, we, we believe that. It will. Uh, it will, it certainly yeah, will. Sure. Um, and then our last segment, we just had um, uh, Mike on from SAS, who runs um, customer intelligence, and all the ad, ad stuff. We were riffing that, hey, four day work week. No, you proposed, the, the, you mentioned I someone. I mentioned Steve Cohen, who said we predicted a four day work week. So the, <laughs> on the fifth day, the machines do the work. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Maybe. Well, I get that. We debated that, but the point. Oh, dude, you're saying it. It's coming. <laughs> no, for me it was an eight-day work week still. So, yeah. um, but okay. But but now that brings the question. Yep. 
these are you know, provocative, intoxicating questions. It's saying, okay, what will be the role of the workplace, the workforce, expectations, role? Does it change role ambiguity? What's the output performance look like? I think everything flips upside down. Yeah. And so I think there's going to be a real disruptive enabler coming in the workplace. What's your, uh, what's your view on that? Because it just seems like it's a, an opportunity, but if not watched, it could be weird. Yeah, I think two, <laughs> two thoughts. One, we have to be careful not to assume that the productivity or efficiency gains, for instance, for using AI to augment human work are guaranteed. Right? and that they're necessarily going to be experienced equally by everybody. There is work involved in making that happen. So that would be the first thing, and we can come back and you know, talk about an experience there. And secondarily, we need to, productivity and efficiency, improving productivity and efficiency is always going to be good for the bottom line. It's going to be good for business. But if those are our only priorities and we just stop there, yeah. I think this will be detrimental for human workers, and it will likely be detrimental, it could have a detrimental effect actually on business innovation yeah. long term as well. Yeah, you mentioned Reggie earlier, Reggie Townsend, he runs mm -hmm. the trust pillar. Yeah. SAS has the, as we report on the opening segment, you know, productivity, performance, trust, sure. and, and responsibility. That's a huge part of the trust equation. I'll bring that back to the workforce. Will the rules of engagement in the workforce change if you have now a combination of at home, hybrid, and office, and AI, do you see any data out there or conversations that are having around what the trust factor is? And, oh, the honor system, I guess it's the honor system. Hey, I hope you're working. Yeah. You know, and yeah. then California has a rule where you can't text, your boss can't text employees. <laughs> no, they did a lot. It's a bill. What? It was a bill that was submitted that says you cannot yeah, text hours, employees. Because yeah. we have a lot of California employees. I'm yeah. texting all, every <laughs> hour. Yeah, you're going to be in jail. <laughs> night. You're going to be in jail. In no, but, no, but in no, it's, it's a societal signal. Mm -hmm. There's like, hey, we have to start thinking work-life balance. Now, some entrepreneurs say, there is no balance in entrepreneurship. That's a whole other topic. I don't want to sure, go there, but sure. stay on the work, sure, sure. the trust piece. Yeah. Is there rules of engagement emerging? Are people talking about this, or is it still too early? I think it, it may be still too early in some, we know, we know that it's important. We definitely see in different applications a worker's ability to apply these tools, even if they're using for in a, in a recommendation type situation, is highly variable. It's highly variable depending on their level of experience. In some applications, less experienced workers, so there was a study from I think Boston Consulting Group about uh, making a chatbot um, trained on their domain knowledge available to their business analysts. Yeah, I'm sure you guys have seen that, probably yeah. have talked yeah. about it, right? And they found that yes, it raised productivity overall, but really, who it really benefited were the, the sort of less experienced analysts. And in fact, the more experienced analysts saw a, a decrease in productivity. Um, just today I saw a, something go by and you might say, oh, well, this, this is a good example of if we augment in all these ways, all of a sudden we're going to get really productive and efficient, we need less people, you need to be less experienced, you can go farther um, you know, in your job. I saw a report about radiologists using this and what they found was results were mixed, using it for diagnostic, right, as a diagnostic tool. And it had absolutely nothing to do, there was no correlation between the radiologist's level of experience and their accuracy prior to using the tool as to whether they were able to use the tool effectively or efficiently or not. And one thing they found I thought was fascinating was everybody, every radiologist that, across the cohort was more prone to accepting an erroneous conclusion from the machine. Really? Right? And so when we, we talk about trust too, it's about understanding how the human perceives and interacts with it and the tools, capabilities, and limitations and making sure that we're designing processes and services that take both of those into account. We cannot just take you know, look at the process and say, at step B, insert AI to provide the output and then continue with your regular process. You have to redesign the business process, the business service. I don't think this will impact a whole lot, to be quite honest, whether we are more productive at home, yeah. is it hybrid or not? I think this is a tool like any other. I think it does impact, though, how do we give people opportunities for improvement? How do we make yeah. sure that people have an opportunity to develop the baseline knowledge and skills, right, just that foundational knowledge that then allows us as we move forward and we suddenly have, you know, time I, to it, spend. And it's, all, and it's also yeah. a huge moving target. I mean, it wasn't that long, it was post iPhone, I believe I'm correct on this, that robots couldn't climb stairs. <laughs> right, I mean, right. things are changing so fast. So GPT-5 versus GPT-4, who knows what that's going to be, but I'm sure yeah. it's going to be a massive 
uptick in capability. Sure. So maybe. Oh, I, I, I'm 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 very confident there'll be a massive uptick yeah. in capability. Now, how that gets applied? I mean, I think it'll be able to take tests better. Sure. It'll be able to do better math. I mean, you know, I, I think there's no question about well, that. But how that affects w new ways to work? Well, and you know, you said you said earlier. Well, maybe we'll have a four-way four-day work week or we are prone to people saying this is going to be great because it's going to do all of the jobs that we need to do or that we think are not great jobs and therefore you're welcome you don't have to do this thing that was maybe not the, the best job but also you know hey you're welcome we've taken away this undesirable job entirely you know go find your bliss well <laughs> I, I don't know about the last time you had some enforced enforced uh, vacation, right? A sister of mine just had surgery and she had all these big plans for all the fun things she was going to do. And within four hours of, of, you know, being on enforced medical sort of restrictions, she wanted to go back to the job she doesn't even like, right? Because, you know, we're not good at that. And so yeah. I think this idea that we want to get rid of human labor, right? That looks as labor, that, that talks about labor as a cost versus humans as a valuable resource. Humans yeah. who have skills that we should invest in and humans who, again, we have to provide pathways for us to develop certain types of skill and foundational knowledge because otherwise we are not going to, we're not going to have anyone who can come up with the next innovation and application, well, and that's really important. Well, RPA is instructive in a way, yeah. but it's also, uh, AI is going to go way past that. So in other words, you talk to anybody who's used RPA, and they'll say, oh, I took away all these mundane jobs, I'm so much happier. Mm -hmm. So to your point, that's fine, AI is going to do that, but if AI all of a sudden really does completely replace you, mm -hmm. that's going to be very, very disruptive, and I, I personally believe it's going to happen. And so we have to start thinking about, all right, what does that mean for the workforce? How do we retrain people? What are well, no, those I think, skills I mean, I think I, my, point, my point was is that I'm fascinated by the impact on, to get the infrastructure, you know, yeah. rec, you know, recognizing you're walking into the building, doors open, all kinds of self-driving cars, autonomous, physical, physical hardware, IOT, that Jason would love to talk more about. But it's really the operational impact, mm -hmm. which is efficiency and productivity, sure. but then how it shapes leadership. How do you manage? Is AI going to change the game for what an executive looks like? Because if all the heavy lifting is done or prompting for suggestions, that opens up creativity. It gives makes someone creative more creative, someone who's not creative, creative. Ideas for a dinner party or ideas for product launch. How do I, so you have new ways to democratize. Again, we're back to democratization. I think we're going to see huge change in what leadership looks like and operations. But, but, so I think the new leadership challenge though is not how do we manage the business when all of these tasks and roles, but probably more tasks, right, have been migrated to AI. It's now how do I operate the business in such a way that I look at my humans as a resource and I provide them opportunities for development and that I'm actually actively engaging and thinking about if AI is doing these things, what is the next job that I can apply this person to do. And this is a really, there's a really simple example, and I have been gone back and tried to find the reference, so this might be a bit apocryphal, um, but I think it's a good exemplar, and I hope I read it right. And it was talking about IKEA. So using um, basic chatbots to automate a lot of the really rote customer service elements, right? And we're talking about being able to take on the work of thousands of fairly low paid, right, low skilled. Um, I mean, I think that's the worst job in the world, so to call that low skilled is, uh, yeah. you know, those folks have a lot of the tolerance the for, for a lot the of things, right? Task. Um, <laughs> God bless them, I, I mean, honestly, yeah. I couldn't do it. Um, so I don't know that we respect that work enough, but, <laughs> but the point being that instead of saying, okay, we now have this thing that can really take down the amount of work and therefore we don't need these, these people anymore, they, they took that whole cohort and trained them to be customer designers. So now we are design, a free design uh, you know, service for our customers who want to come you know, redesign their room, you know, uh, home decor, et cetera, et cetera. And mm. that opened up a whole new business. Yeah. And, and a, like a, I, think, I think the, if my memory serves, it was like a billion dollars you know, in uh, some, some outrageous amount of, of sort of revenue and profit. That's a good example of as leaders moving forward, our challenge is not to figure out how to just operate a machine, it's to figure out how to find and create opportunities to use humans uh, in a way that then creates new business opportunities. Yeah, that's awesome. Kimberly, great to have you on here, theCUBE. Um, you got the pod going on. Yeah. It's got Lyft, you got some topics. What's your favorite topic guest uh, you've had on so far? 
I knew everyone asked me that, so I had to ask you. <laughs> I, I don't even think I'm going to be able to. <laughs> I can't remember who I interviewed like yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, you know, honestly, I, I'm, I'm really bad about it. I think my favorite guest is always the last one I spoke to, um, which this time, this time just happens to be uh, Kate Moran and uh, uh, Sarah Gibbons um, from uh, Nielsen Norman Group. Um, I'm, I'm really bad about this because I think every time you have yeah. this conversation, I don't know if you have this experience, I yeah. walk away just thinking differently about something yeah. with so many questions. And so they'll say to me, you know, pick one snippet for, for promo. And, and I come back with like six and they're like, no, yeah. I need to be yeah. 30 seconds in one. And I'm like, yeah. I can't do it. And you learn a lot um, too. So it's hard to like say one's better than the other because I... You learn on all of them, yeah. and it's like they build on each. Yeah, you know? yeah. They do, and I and I've been really um, pleased and, and really humbled that a lot of our guests recommend other guests to us to come on and, and speak with us, and we're able to talk. I think around we're not talking about the technology in terms of the hardcore, but what are all these things that Cassie this morning talked about the soft skills or the soft considerations for making sure that the technology is actually. They want to come back because they had a good experience. Final question yeah. for you, or, or last word. Sure. Um, what's the future of the pod? What's the goal? What's, is the title Pondering AI? Is it the name it of the? It is Pondering okay, AI. Okay, you're on, you're on yeah. the, um, 50 episodes up almost. What's the goal? What's your objective? What, what's the outcome look like? I, I think the ob objective, to, you know, you asked me at the start of this, are, do you consider yourself a futurist, right? And I said, no, I, I really don't, although people who hear me pontificate about things might argue about that. Yeah. I, I, I think honestly, to some extent, the goal of the pod, especially for business, whether you're a you know, business leader, an executive, or a data scientist just coming up, is to allow you to be sort of futurist in your field. So you can think about not just the technology, but seat it in the social context, seat it in the corporate context, you know, all of those components so that we can start to, yeah. to look ahead. And if, if we help even one person do that, then yeah. I'm completely- It's really a great service. Podcast a great format for riffing, great for <laughs> conversations, great for getting data and facts. Yeah. Uh, real, real good value for users. Thanks for coming on the Thank Cube. You Appreciate so it, Kimberly. Great to have you. Okay, it. I'm John Furrier with Dave Vellante. Day one of two days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage in Las Vegas for Innovate 24. We'll be right back after this short break.